Thank you very much for the invitation. I, would, I too would like to first start by thanking Milton and the organising committee here at the Ovarian Club for inviting me to this very exciting meeting and it's my first time to this meeting as well and uh, I've re really enjoyed the meeting thus far. I must admit I was a bit concerned as to how many people were probably going to turn up for my lunchtime uh, talk given that there's a lot of si certainly a lot of science at this uh, meeting and there's going to be very little science I guess in a way um, or basic science in my uh, presentation today. So as mentioned earlier I herald from uh, Sydney in Australia and Sydney like Hong Kong is a harbour city and we have the uh, probably world famous uh, that is aware of the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge and Hong Kong Harbour is, uh, I'm hoping to see a bit more of it over the next uh, day or two uh, when I stay in Hong Kong for a few more days. So. so I'm at the University of New South Wales uh, and Royal Hospital for Women and they're co-located in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and this is the Pacific, Pacific Ocean and those who you may have heard of Bondi Beach not too far away so and that's just the university campus and the hospital campus uh, where I work so in terms of disclosure I have a very minor shareholding of Virtus Health which owns a number of IVF units in Australia and overseas and I've had past sponsorship by ph various pharmaceutical companies to present at uh, scientific meetings So the guidelines here, the main document, were approved and published on the 29th of June this year and were officially launched on the 2nd of July in, uh, at ESHRAE in Barcelona in Spain this year. And there have been three papers co-published in clinical endocrinology, human reproduction and fertility, fertility and sterility uh, which summarise the recommendations and aiming to try and reach a broader audience. So evidence-based guidelines aim to combine, I guess, the best evidence from research along with clinical expertise, the consumer perspectives such as patients' values and preferences and cost effectiveness to hopefully promote the best evidence-based practice. So these guidelines were an international collaboration. They were led by Australian, led by the Centre of Research Excellence in PCOS, with uh, and partnering with ESHRA and ASRM. There were five guideline development groups comprising of 63 international multidisciplinary experts and consumer members, representing 37 leading international societies and consumer groups across 71 countries. There were 60 evidence reviews, 40 of them are systematic reviews and 20 narrative reviews leading to 166 recommendations and practice points and 31 of those were evidence based recommendations, 59 were clinical consensus recommendations and 76 were clinical practice points and I'll be explaining the difference between those soon. It took three years to complete and it was approved by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council and it all ended up, I guess, with one guideline of about 201 pages and a guideline technical report of around 1,800 pages. And for those who are interested in, I guess, the process of it all, it's the, uh, a paper recently published going through the process of how the guidelines are all undertaken. So both the guideline and the technical report are uh, downloadable and freely available at that uh, website address, but at the moment, if you just Google PCOS guidelines, uh, they'll come up, so. So the guidelines addressed five key priority areas, and these key priority areas are um, composed, composed of 60 clinical questions, which came about through uh, surveying and doing focus groups on over 3,000 international health professionals and consumers who then rank the topics and rank the, the, the questions in order to priori prioritise them. And the, each area had its own guideline development group 
uh, guideline development group was on diagnosis and screening. Number two was emotional well-being. Three, lifestyle. Four was uh, treatment for non-infertility, medical treatment, and the fifth one was the uh, for fertility. So interpreting the recommendations is key. So there were various categories of recommendations which I alluded to earlier. There was evidence-based recommendations, uh, clinical consensus recommendations, and clinical practice points. So evidence-based recommendations was where the evidence was sought and found in PCOS. Clinical consensus recommendations was where the evidence was sought and there was no evidence uh, found specifically in PCOS, but consensus was able to be made on evidence from either the general population or closely related populations such as uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And then there were clinical practice points where the evidence wasn't even sought, but these clinical practice points arose through discussions around the, uh, the, uh, recommend the evidence-based and, and consensus recommendations. We also had to assess the quality of the evidence, uh, being the certainty of evidence and how certain we were that the estimate of effect actually reflected the, the true effect, and it was graded as high, moderate, low and very low. And we also followed the grade system uh, in coming up with the recommendation and grading the recommendations as being either strong or conditional or weak. So with the grade approach, I guess, the strength of recommendations, what they mean from the perspective of, of the clinician is that with a strong rec recommendation, you should probably just do it or a brief explanation of the relative merits of alternatives with the patients because most being all or almost all informed patients would choose the recommended management. Weak or conditional recommendations is uh, you should offer the intervention but there should be more discussion regarding the alternatives in terms of benefits and risks uh, for both the recommendation or other alternatives and taking into account patients' values and preferences because most but not all patients would follow the recommendation uh, and it really depends on their individual values and preferences. So strong recommendations were made where the guideline group was confident that uh, the desirable effects of adhering to a particular recommendation would outweigh the undesirable effects and with weak recommendations the desirable effects of adhering to a recommendation would probably outweigh the undesirable effects, but we would be less confident about that. So there's quite a few recommendations and things to go through, and obviously I don't have the time to go through all of them, but everyone can, I guess, read them at their, at their leisure. So today I'll just be talking about a, uh, some of the evidence-based recommendations and, and other recommendations. So I guess the first thing was that uh, we endorsed the uh, Rotterdam criteria in adults for the diagnosis of PCOS, being two of three of the features of oligo or anovulation, clinical or biochemical hyperangenism and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, with the exclusion of other uh, causes for those same um, symptoms and signs. And we also came up with a tighter criteria for the diagnosis in adolescence, and in fact it's, it was um, where it required both oligoanovulation and clinical or biochemical hyperangenism and the exclusion of other causes, but to uh, ignore or not use ultrasound morphology in the diagnosis for adolescence, which we defined as being less than eight years post-menarche, and that's because of their high incidence of multifollicular and polycystic ovaries in that, that age group. So the diagnosis for adolescence, for those of you who are aware of the old NIH criteria, followed, followed that. How to assess polycystic ovary morphology on ultrasound? Well, um, there was a clinical consensus recommendation that if you're using vaginal ultrasound with uh, transducer frequencies of at least 8 megahertz being the newer technology, then the threshold for polycystic ovaries on either ovary should be a follicle number per ovary of 20 or more and or ovarian volume of more than 10 mils, ensuring there's no corpora lutea, cis or dominant follicles present. If you're using the older technology, 
then the threshold should be just ovarian volume of 10 mils or more in either ovary. And if you're using transabdominal ultrasound, then it's ovarian volume with a threshold of at least 10 mils, given the uh, difficulties, uh, difficulty of reliably assessing follicle numbers uh, transabdominally. Lifestyle. So lifestyle was, is promoted as being first-line therapy because, uh, for both fertility, reproductive and metabolic outcomes. Healthy lifestyle, being healthy eating, regular physical activity for excess weight gain prevention is important for all women with PCOS regardless of weight. Those who have excess weight, being overweight or obese, aim for 5 to 10% weight loss, which can yield significant clinical improvements and aim for that over, over six months. With diet, there's no specific um, diet, but it does have to be a, uh, an energy deficient uh, or deficit uh, diet. There's, there's no evidence that any uh, particular energy equivalent diet is better than another in, in PCOS. With exercise, if to prevent weight gain, there was recommended moderate intensity of at least 150 minutes a week or vigorous 75 minutes per week. If the uh, objective is weight loss, then at least 250 minutes per week of moderate intensity and at least 150 minutes per week of vigorous. And also uh, behavioural strategies play a role, including goal setting, self-monitoring, slow eating and so forth. The combined oral contraceptive pill, when should it be used? Well, it should be recommended in adult women with PCOS for the management of hyperandrogenism and or irregular menstrual cycles. And this was an evidence-based recommendation, strong recommendation based on low quality of evidence. The combined oral contraceptive pill alone should be considered in adolescence, either with a clear diagnosis of PCOS or deemed at risk but not yet diagnosed with PCOS. And that usually means that they have either ovulatory dysfunction or hyperangenism, but not both, and thus don't fulfil the criteria for diagnosis. Um, but you can uh, consider the um, oral contraceptive pill in that situation, again, for clinical hyperangenism and or irregular menstrual cycles. And this also was evidence-based recommendation, conditional recommendation, based on low quality of evidence. In terms of the, which uh, oral, combined oral contraceptive pill to use, well, specific types or doses of progestogens or estrogens or combinations of the combined oral contraceptive pill cannot currently be recommended in adults and adolescents with PCOS. Um, and practice should be informed by general practice guidelines. So there's no evidence that one particular oral contraceptive pill is better than another in, in treating treatment of uh, PCOS. And generally speaking, the general population guidelines is to uh, use a low-dose pill, uh, 30, 35 micrograms and so forth. And the other recommendation that came out was that the 35 microgram ethanol estradiol plus cyproperitone acetate preparation should not be considered first line in PCOS as per general population guidelines due to uh, adverse ri risks, including increased risk of venous thromboembolism. And this was a conditional uh, um, recommendation. It was a con uh, clinical consensus recommendation, and therefore there was, and the quality of evidence was not applicable. With the oral contraceptive pill, consider adding metformin if there's metabolic features such as impaired glucose tolerance or high risk of type 2 diabetes, if there's been failed lifestyle changes. And this, again, was an evidence-based recommendation, strong based on low quality of evidence. And you can also consider adding to the oral contraceptive pill antiandrogens if there's been at least six months uh, of using the combined oral contraceptive pill with cosmetic therapy which has failed to adequately improve the patient's hirsutism. This was evidence-based recommendation, conditional low quality of evidence. And also you can consider adding antiandrogen if for the treatment of androgen-related alopecia. And this was a clinical consensus recommendation, conditional recommendation, and again, the quality of evidence not applicable. In terms of other pharmacological treatments, consider metformin, and 
in a, uh, with lifestyle if there's excess weight for the management of weight and metabolic outcomes. Evidence-based recommendation, conditional low quality of evidence. You can consider anti-obesity medications combined with lifestyle if there's been failed lifestyle for the management of obesity as per general population recommendations. And this was a clinical consensus uh, recommendation, conditional, again, quality of evidence not applicable. You can consider anti-antigens with effective contraception in order to minimise the risk of uh, male under visualisation to treat hirsutism and androgen-related alopecia where the oral contraceptive pill is contraindicated or poorly tolerated. And this also was evidence-based recommendation, conditional, very low quality of evidence. And inositol, inositol is considered an experimental therapy uh, in PCOS with the need for further research. So this was guideline development group five, um, the, the assessment and management of infertility. This was the guideline development group that, uh, that I chaired and we had a number of um, some face-to-face -face meetings and this was our LUT as well as Zoom and so forth. And this uh, was a picture of some of us in San Antonio last year at, at the ASRM where we spent three days um, following the ASRM, uh, going, through all the, uh, to, to going through all the evidence, evidence that we'd previously looked at to come up with the recommendations. And you can see there's uh, representation from, I guess, around the world, uh, including uh, Zi Chiao, who, was, who spoke earlier uh, this morning here from uh, Beijing. So each of the guideline development groups uh, came up with an algorithm, uh, and this was the algorithm for the assessment and treatment of infertility. And you can see that letrozole is, is now considered as first-line therapy. This was an important recommendation to come out of the guideline because in the past, first-line therapy was um, always clomiphene citrate, and then it was clomiphene citrate and not letrozole and then it was clomiphene citrate or letrozole, and now we're saying it's letrozole. So letrozole is first-line pharmacological ovulation induction. So the recommendation reads, letrozole should be considered first-line pharmacological treatment for ovulation induction in women with PCOS with n ovulatory infertility and no other infertility factors to improve ovulation, pregnancy, and live birth rates. And this was an evidence-based recommendation. It was a strong recommendation because the four diamonds uh, means strong, one diamond means conditional against, uh, two diamonds means conditional either way, and three is conditional for the intervention, and four is a strong, recommenda wrong rec strong recommendation. Two crossed out circles means it's on based on low quality evidence, so one crossed out circle is very low quality, two is low, three is moderate, and four is high quality evidence. But we were able to make this a strong recommendation because the evidence for the outcomes of ovulation, pregnancy, and live birth rates came from moderate quality evidence. There was also a clinical practice point that health professionals and women need to be aware that the risk of multiple pregnancy appears to be less with letrozole compared to clomiphene citrate. So where did the evidence come from to inform that recommendation for the guidelines, well it came from two sources. One was um, the evidence-based guideline, the Australian guidelines which were updated for the section on aromatase inhibitors in 2015. And it also came from our uh, systematic review that we published in BMJ last year. And this which was the first uh, systematic review and network meta-analysis in ovulation induction. And the aim of this systematic review and network meta-analysis was to identify the first, the best first-line ovulation induction treatment in WH group two, women including PCOS and ovulation. And it looked at comparing eight ovulation induction treatments, placebo or no treatment, clomiphene citrate, letrozole, metformin, clomiphene combined with metformin, tamoxifen, gonadotrophins and laparoscopic ovarian drilling. And 
the summary of the main clinical findings of that paper were, was that uh, you'd be glad to know that all pharmacological ovulation induction treatments were superior to placebo or no treatment in terms of ovulation rate and pregnancy rate, and that letrozole can be recommended as first-line treatment. Letrozole, and that's because letrozole was superior to clomiphene citrate for all outcomes, ovulation rate, pregnancy rate, live birth rate, and reduction in multiple pregnancy rate. It was the only ovulation induction treatment superior to clomiphene citrate for live birth rate. It was the only ovulation induction treatment superior to clomiphene citrate in therapy naive women in terms of pregnancy rate. So that's um, women with PCOS and N ovulation who, ha who had not been previously exposed to ovulation induction treatment. And it was the only ovulation induction treatment superior to clomiphene citrate in high quality randomised controlled trials and that were randomised controlled trials with low risk of randomisation and allocation concealment bias. And both metformin with an odds ratio of 0.22 and letrozole with an odds ratio of 0.46 have a lower multiple pregnancy rate compared to clomiphene citrate and, and those, um, that was statistically significant. So we also said that uh, gonadotrophins could be considered as first line um, pharmacological treatment for infertility. And so the recommendation reads, gonadotrophins could be considered as first-line treatment in the presence of ultrasound monitoring following counselling on cost and potential risk of multiple pregnancy in women with PCOS and ovatory infertility and no other infertility factors. This was an evidence-based recommendation. It was a conditional recommendation based on low quality of evidence. And the evidence that informed this recommendation came from Brown's Cochrane Systematic Review published in 2016, which compared clomiphene citrate versus gonadotrophins in therapy naive PCOS women. And the evidence, uh, and they looked at the outcome of live birth ongoing pregnancy, and the evidence favoured gonadotrophins. Adding metformin to gonadotrophins in clomiphene citrate resistant PCOS could improve reproductive outcome. So what we mean by clomiphene citrate resistant PCOS is women with PCOS who have tried 50, 100, 150 milligrams of clomiphene citrate and failed to ovulate on clomiphene citrate. So the recommendation reads gonadotrophins with the addition of uh, metformin could be used rather than gonadotrophins alone in women with PCOS with anovitary infertility, clomiphene citrate resistance and no other infertility factors to improve ovulation, pregnancy and live birth rates. This also was an evidence-based recommendation. It was a conditional recommendation. It was based on moderate quality evidence. And the evidence that informed this recommendation came from our, systematic, our Cochrane Systematic Review that we published last year which compared gonadotrophins versus gonadotrophins combined with metformin in clomiphene citrate resistant PCOS. And we looked at the outcome of live birth rate. Uh, here you'll see the forest plot and the evidence favours uh, combining metformin with gonadotrophins. Gonadotrophins should be used in preference to clomiphene citrate combined with metformin for ovulation induction in clomiphene citrate resistant PCOS to improve ovulation, pregnancy and live birth rates. And this was a evidence-based recommendation. It was a strong recommendation. It was based on moderate quality evidence and the evidence was informed by Abu Hassam's systematic review published in 2015 which compared gonadotrophins versus clomiphene citrate combined with metformin in clomiphene citrate resistant PCOS women. And they looked at live birth rate and the evidence favoured gonadotrophins. We also looked at IVF as part of the recommendations and the recommendation, one of the recommendations was that in the absence of an absolute indication for IVF ICSI, women with PCOS and their novitary infertility could be offered IVF as a third line therapy where first or second line ovulation induction therapies have failed. And this was a clinical consensus uh, recommendation, not an evidence-based recommendation because we didn't, could not find any 
randomised controlled trials also, and hence systematic reviews of randomised controlled trials that compared IVF versus any of the ovulation induction treatments or placebo no treatment specifically in women with PCOS. And this was a conditional recommendation. Other recommendations in, um, when we looked at IVF was that the GNH antagonist protocol is preferred to the GNH agonist long protocol to reduce the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It also reduced the duration of stimulation and the total dose of gonadotrophins used. This was an evidence-based recommendation, conditional recommendation, low quality of evidence. Either urinary or recombinant FSH can be used. This was a clinical consensus recommendation, conditional recommendation, and the quality of evidence was not applicable. Exogenous recombinant LH should not be routinely used with FSH, and this was a clinical consensus recommendation, conditional recommendation, quality of evidence not applicable, and adjunct metformin therapy could be used with the GNH agonist protocol to improve the clinical pregnancy rate and reduce the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This was an evidence-based recommendation, conditional recommendation based on low quality evidence. So when you look up the guidelines and the website, you'll also see that there are five algorithms, uh, each representing each of the key priority areas that were addressed in the guidelines. And this, these are a clinical decision support tool, and there's a series of five of them based on the guideline development areas, and they promote best practice, and they all reflect and therefore ensure consistent, standardised evidence-based care, they're all consistent with the recommendations, and as I said, they're freely uh, accessible digitally and uh, downloadable. There's also consumer visual fact uh, sheets. There's a series of five of these, again, each reflecting each of the key priority areas, and they aim to reach an international audience. Uh, you need low health literacy to understand these visual fact sheets, they were ex extensively tested by PCOS consumers and they're visually engaging, low text and again freely, free digital access and downloadable. We also developed the first um, evidence-based uh, PCOS uh, app called Ask PCOS and it um, has a self-diagnosis function for consumers uh, with, uh, at, ask, after asking uh, a number of questions. It can um, allow delivery of personalised information. All the information on the app, again, is consistent with the recommendations in the guideline. And uh, there's variable pricing policy. In Australia, it's about $2.99, I think, for, for the app, but there is very low cost in developing countries to try and um, promote the guidelines uh, as far as we can. And it's available in iTunes, and I believe it's now available in five languages, as listed there on the slide. So this is my final slide and I would just like to acknowledge the Centre of Research Excellence in PCOS uh, in Australia, which led the guidelines in partnership with uh, ASRM and ESHRA. I want to also acknowledge the main authors to the guidelines, which are listed there on that slide, and also the 70 members of the International PCOS Network who all contributed to the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you.